You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Let's say I'm I'm away and I'm touring with England, my first tour away in England. I was away for three months in the Caribbean and payment for that was 13 grand. Yeah, ah, there you go. So it's you have all this pomp and you have all this ceremony and people see you on TV and the, ex- the interpretation they get of that or what they get from that is, wow, you're minted and blah, blah, blah. Now, 13 grand, we're going back now 30 years on top of your, your wages. Then you're nice. Yeah. But it's not a place where you can afford to party. People are talking about me playing for England. Um, on my 22nd birthday, I made my, I made my debut for England. So I'm living that first part. I'm just living this dream. Where it comes to match fixing, bizarrely enough, I know very little. What I know is because somebody came to me and started talking and I'm there going, flipping out. Now, whether what he's saying is true, I don't even know. But he's gobbing about it, isn't he? So I'm there going, "Mm -mm -mm." but now I'm in a funny position now because I've met with you eh? and I'm exposed. It seems within no time at all. Um, I'm on my way to the Caribbean and the idea is I'm going to bring some drugs back into the country and I'm going to get paid 50 grand doing that. Um, I I I keep saying to people that, you know, at that moment, I'm not thinking that I want to be a drug dealer. I want to be a bad boy. I'm just thinking 50 grand, that would be handy. Handy just to give a bit of space and you work out what you're going to do next. You know, just alleviate the thing and sometimes like a lot of things, the way out or the thing, the way out you choose just gets you deeper in, just causes more problems. So here I am coming back. And of course, I'm stopped at the bloody air. I'm stopped at the airport. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Big Chris Lewis. How are you, brother? Big in. How Good to you? see you. Nice to be here, mate. Nice to finally catch up. Yeah, I know, mate. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. Speaking for a while, but first and foremost, how are you, brother? I'm good. Um, better than ever, actually, um, as it happens. Good, mate. Very fascinating story. English international cricket player to then drug smuggling. You end up getting a 13-year sentence. Like, mad that shit on it, but it's a... Uh, it's an interesting story that people like to hear. People love to hear that mad <laughs> shit, bro. Like, the way you're speaking, for it, like the way you talk, you think, man, he's a, a big, quiet man. Like, And then, obviously, when you meet him, you're a big presence, six feet three. And then you're like, ah, fucking hell, man. But 13 years is a long time, brother. Boy, let's just say it, it was a, it's a journey. And perhaps just to encapsulate all of it, you know, um, if part of that time I didn't scare myself to death, going to jail and a few other stuff. Um, I've enjoyed the ride. I've learned so much. I've become so much more um, because of those journeys, you know. Um, in the beginning, as a young boy, I I just dreamt about, about playing cricket, about emulating my heroes. The idea behind that is that you play cricket, you'll be famous, um, you'll be able to afford the things that you want. Life is sorted. You know, <laughs> you're young, it's simple. You know, if I had a bit of cash and I'm um, having a bit of fun, um, you don't look beyond that. Um, I guess I was fortunate enough to be able to achieve those things. And you get there and then, of course, um, there's more. You look at that and you go, okay, in my case, it was to be a professional cricketer. And then you go, an international cricketer. And then you want to be one of the best. And all the while, you're looking for that that enjoyment, that space where you feel good, you know? Um, and you get those things and you realize that it's not necessarily, that space isn't necessarily there or it's not the things, you know? Um, so you move on, you you make a, a different plan. And certainly in my case, sometimes you get it horribly wrong and you, you end up in a dark place also. But 
at the end of it, now it's actually all over. Um, all of that stuff actually served me in a way that I learned so much and I, I feel that much more confident. I feel that much more capable of just doing my stuff right now. Yeah. You know, so. You learn more from your mistakes anyway. And the, the, the thing about life is everybody makes mistakes. Everybody's too quick to judge. Everybody's too quick to point fingers as if their lives are perfect. We all fuck up. We all make mistakes. The thing about yourself is you put your hands up and says, look, I fucked up. <laughs> just like everybody. So fair play to that. But I always like to go right back to the start of my guests. No, let's do it. Where you grew up and how it all began. I grew up in a place called Guyana, um, South is America. That? South America? Yeah. Um, just on the coast of the, um, the Caribbean, about Trinidad is about 40 minutes off the coast. Um, for us, um, we were more Caribbean than probably South America. You think of South America, you think of the different European language, you think of Spanish, but we spoke English and we took part in the Caribbean side of things with the British. Um, we played cricket. So as a young boy growing up in Guyana, I aspired to be Viv Richards and Michael Holden and all those guys at the time who we all looked up to. Um, I would describe it as just, a, at the time, a normal upbringing. Um, during the day when you weren't at school, we were not even in our shorts. We were in our underwear, just running around the streets and playing cricket and just having fun. So it was just, it was just fun times, but you're there and you're dreaming. And in Guyana, being a former British colony, most of us dreamt about making ourselves better by traveling abroad, by traveling to England. So that was a thing that lots of people aspired to. So my father, um, within a year of me being born, was on his way to England to, you know, make things better. So not leaving anybody behind, as perhaps some people would see it, um, a bit of a pioneer setting out and going to a foreign land with the idea of getting work and making good for the family. My mom joined him a few years later. And then I arrived as a 10 year old, you know, um, to this place that I'd heard so much about. Um, I'd only heard brilliant stories. Streets of London are paved with gold and all the stories you heard in Guyana were such grand stories about everything. So there's all that excitement and everything else um, about coming, um, eager to come. Um, yes, there's so much sadness that you're leaving your aunts, your uncles and your grandmother and all those people behind, um, but eager to come and start the adventure. And I get here and it was cold. <laughs> <laughs> the streets are paved with <laughs> shit and depression. Yeah, they, so, they sold you the story yeah, well, mate. Yeah, here I am, I'm yeah. driving from the airport, I'm looking and I'm taking it in and I'm going, oh, all oh, right, yeah. oh, mate, have I really done this? It's so grey and everything's look, looked bleak and it's cold. Um, so it was a bit of a shock for the first, I think it was about six weeks. I was at home before I started my school and it was a bit of a shock. I think I spent a lot of days sort of crying, just crying, I don't want to be here, I want to go back to my grand, um, that sort of thing. But it all shifted, I think, when I started school. After I started school, the school played cricket. And that was the thing I knew from back home. Everything else, or a lot of stuff, I was kind of learning. Um, it's a new culture, even the food. I mean, I'd never come across things like blancmange and all that sort of stuff. So I'm looking at the food and poking at it, going, what's that? You know, um, cauliflower and just simple things that people would just take for granted. I hadn't seen, so I'm just looking at this stuff suspiciously and going, okay, what's that and what's this? Um, again, like so much of it, it's just a, a massive learning curve. But the thing that I suppose gave me a bit of comfort within all of that was summertime and cricket because I'd played, I'd played cricket since I was a kid. I had listened to cricket since I was a kid. So that was, that was my thing. Now, I hadn't played cricket at any standard. I was one of the guys just playing in the street for, um, for jokes. So I wasn't playing for any team, but I could play. And so when cricket season started here um, at school, um, that's what I threw myself into. Um, that was my kind of, my kind of haven. Um, as a young boy. So I don't think I was the most academic young boy. I was the boy 
who was always staring out the window in the class when he should be doing his work. Um, sort of thing, dreaming about cricket pitches probably. Uh, daydreaming. <laughs> yeah, um, I, was a, I was a little bit like that. Um, but fortunately for me, at sort of 16 or 17, you see me six foot now, I wasn't that then. I grew and I became a bit stronger and a lot more people started taking notice of my cricket. And at 17, I'm leaving home. I'm on my way to Leicester to be a professional cricketer. Um, I'm stoked, isn't it? You know, that's the thing you've always wanted to do. And here I am packing my bags and I'm and there and I get to Leicester. And then you see people like Peter Willie and David Gower. And they're, they're good, not good cricketers, they're fantastic cricketers. And the idea is I'm supposed to be in the team with them. And I was, I've was i just been playing in the park with my mates. Um, so it was a big, big jump, perhaps emotionally and confidence-wise, to start to get your head around that you, you're going to be in the team with these guys. And the expectation is that you have to perform. But all of that, but I'm really excited, mate. I'm just so excited. And you, you're seeing things, you're meeting people. Um, all those sort of things. And I think at the same time, it's the first time going, becoming a professional at 17 that I'd really actually trained my body. Before you go and have a kick around in the park, yeah, you play all day with your mates, but I'd never actually trained my body. And here we were training twice a day. And it kind of took off. My body caught to it and the training. And within a year, I'm on a, a young England trip in the World Cup to Australia. I come back and it's another year and people are talking about me playing for England. Um, on my 22nd birthday, I made my I made my debut for England. So I'm living that first part. I'm just living this dream where you're going, wow, look what's happened there. You're just doing your thing and enjoying your cricket and you're going, oh, wow, you're playing for England. And wow, you're doing that. And you, wow, you're doing that. Um, but... I suppose that, that never quite lasts for, for various reasons. Whether you, you take your eye off the ball, um, you start enjoying things perhaps off the field um, a little bit too much. Relationships become, become complicated. Um, but in the end, I ended up playing 80 odd times. That's an unbelievable achievement, no? Um, Were you partying like when you started making it? Did you have that? Because I know, I know a few boys from Trinidad and they love their rum, and the rum's like fucking you know eighty percent. It's like was, strong was, shit. Was, you know, I was all right. Uh, you could say I was lucky mm -hmm. because when I started, I didn't, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink. I was the kid that people were trying to get to have a lager, but he was there with his water. Yeah. So even though, is I like dancing, so. I did have late nights, but nightclubs don't open till 11, mate. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so there's no point in going out at nine o'clock. Uh -huh. you know I mean? But certainly I think until my mid to late twenties, I was, I was a non-drinker. I was a non-smoker. Dedicated but, to your craft. Yeah, but I did like dancing. So I'd finish cricket, 6.30, go back to the hotel, go back home, have something to eat, have a nap. And I'd be, peeking out about 11 o'clock to go listen to some music somewhere, have a dance, two o'clock, 2.30, we're done, back in bed. Um, and that worked for me, um, the first part of it. Perhaps it becomes a little bit more difficult when you get into a bit of drinking. Uh, <laughs> and you get into some things that like shit happens like that. <laughs> you, you know, um, and certainly that, that happened to me. And... But at the same time, I tried very much to enjoy my experience. Um, so money is spent and unfortunately for me, things come to an abrupt end. Yeah, as things do. But see, when you were in Trinidad, see, to come to England, did you find it easier to adapt because it was a British colony and you, you learned English uh, before you arrived? Well, it was, it was Guyana. We were just not far from Trinidad. Yeah. We were about 40 minutes from Trinidad. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, the fact that so many things that we learned was from a British perspective. Mm -hmm. It was a British colony, so we learned all things British. Um, so when you come, there is so much that you understand, but of course there's so much you don't understand because of course you've never experienced all of that. You've had the words and you have an idea and, Britain, and England is this place and, and so forth. And of yeah. course you, 
you speak the language so you can, uh, well, a version of the language. Did that help though? Oh, um, for sure it did. For sure yeah. it did. To have to come and at the same time be in a new place with all those new things and not know the language, I would imagine makes it that much harder. Yeah, struggling to actually, more. Yeah, yeah, to actually, you know, get engrossed in things and, and, and belong to things. So. How was it being away from your mum and dad the first 10 years when they moved to England? Was that tough? Or? Do you know, do you know it's, it's, it's a different culture. And all of my friends, we all grew up with our grandparents. It was an environment where you weren't necessarily living in a nuclear family, you and your parents. Um, the extended family lived in a house in most cases, if you see what I mean. So the environment, most of your time, you spend with your grandmother, even though your mom was in the house. She went to work and people had to go and find work because there's there's no government aid. So you have to go off and you have to do things. So people have to be active. So most of us grew up with our grandparents. So mom, mom, mom going, of course, but... In a funny, in a funny sort of way, I packed her off nicely because my grandmother let me do whatever I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. After my dad left, um, mom had to be mom and dad. Yeah, but so she had tough. to be the yeah, yeah, and she had a young boy who was trying to get himself into all sorts of trouble as mm. you do. So mom had to be that one that was that was tough. Where my grandmother was just my grandmother, so I tended to hang out with my grandmother uh, quite a lot, but. No, it's different perceptions. Um, I hear when I tell this story, sometimes people go, oh my God, that was so sad, or that was this. Or I talk about my upbringing in the Caribbean where as young kids, we had to go and fetch water to have our bath. Our toilets are actually outside. You call it a hole in the ground with a hut and you tell that story. And people's perception of that, oh my God, that was so sad, you're so abused. And they go, Oh, stop. There was an absolutely none of that. Here I am, and I'm, I'm having the time of my life. You're just looking at it from different lens. You know, so the idea that mom went, dad went, um, you more look at those guys as heroes because they're going to prepare the way. They are, to, to an extent, adventurous. They're... Brusque takers. Yeah, they are willing to go to mm -hmm. another country, a place they don't know for the betterment of all of us. So the perception and how people looked at it is perhaps very different than people looking back now and perhaps just looking at the fact that they're leaving. Yeah. The scary thing is that people might think that's poverty, but you'll look at, probably look at kids now on their phones, overweight, depressed, and then you'll look at the kids back home when they're running about, not got much, but are happier you look than into anybody their, on the look planet. Into their face, you see that. Do, do, you, see, do you, you see that the difference from... Uh, kids from the UK, from kids um, back home? I think for me, I would say that over the years, um, it's changed. Um, when I came here, perhaps not so much. I think generally as West Indians, people see us as being a bit more exuberant. So as a person coming here, um, I felt free to express myself because that's how we were um, back home. Um, your differences or you do this, that's fine, he does that, he does this. I find that over here, that perhaps being a little bit more different, the expectation is that people follow, follow a pattern. So from that perspective, the kids were a little bit more subdued. Kids are kids, they look for their happiness, generally speaking, but there were a lot more rules and regulations um, going on, yeah. um, so to speak. But I would say now, we're now 40 years on, I would say most definitely um, kids seem to have a lot more stuff around them, but that hasn't equated to more happiness. Yeah. Um, to be perfect. Yeah, I think a lot of people here are spoiled. We don't. There's too many distractions. Now, in my own opinion, I've got kids and it's hard to keep them away from iPads and phones, but part, I've got to take responsibility for that because I've gave them that stuff. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You want a couple hours go on your iPad, but then as time goes, they're so consumed by it. As soon as they finish school, they want phones, they want iPads. It, and it's, it. a, it's an interesting one. I mean, I, I, I look at it from the people around, around my space and what I see was perhaps a lot of people who had difficult times in their life growing up because 
the old world, so to speak, wasn't an easy world. People had to work and it was, it was difficult times and they experienced lots of things. And I think it's almost natural that you look at your, your kids and you go, the things that I went through, some of those things, I wouldn't want them to go through. Um, whether that some of the people were, when they were young might have been hungry or they didn't have this and they didn't have that and so forth. So perhaps there was almost an overreaction to our kids. And we went, here you go, have everything. <laughs> if you see what I mean, yeah. <laughs> without fully necessarily appreciating that perhaps there's something gained, as you pointed out earlier, in having to experience certain types of things, having to work it out, yeah. you know, having to, things not necessarily always being comfortable and things not always being there. Um, it turns out it teaches you a lots of skills um, that you may need later on for life. Yeah. So you made your England debut at 21, were you? I was 22, it was my 22nd, 20, 22nd birthday. So how was that feeling then, kids just coming over? You've only been here 10 years to then, did you, did you ever, did West Indies not want to take you on? No, it was it was a difficult thing in the sense that once I was here, in order to get into the game, I had to become pretty much um, an English qualified player because at the time you only allowed so many overseas players. Mm -hmm. So if I'm allegiance with the West Indies, it, I qualify as an overseas player and each club is only allowed two. And of course they're going for the superstars. They're not going for the trialists. So that's the non-starter. So being in England simply meant in order to play cricket, you had to become English, but that was part of the plan anyway. That's why I was here, so to speak. So yeah. um, I got my papers. Uh, I think I was 17 when I actually got my papers. Um, but that day, it's still the most exciting day in my cricketing life because you dream about stuff and I never thought necessarily it was going to happen. And then there you are in the midst of it and you're 22 but you dreamt this when you were seven or eight and you just go, shit, wow, look at that. Holy fuck, what do I do? <laughs> 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 uh, and then you go, okay, do what you've always done. I'm gonna have to blag this just like everything else. So off you go, mate, do your stuff. Um, but listen, it was, a, it, was a, it was a beautiful day and not just from the enjoyment, it was in the Caribbean. Yeah, um, my family and people were there to see. Um, it was against West Indies, so that meant those same guys I talked about, Viv Richards, I was playing against them. Oh, shit, I didn't imagine that. I thought you'd be long gone so I could have a chance, you know what I mean? But um, there you are. So I had, it was a great day and so informative in the sense that the realisation that your dreams can come true because... I dreamt that when I was a little boy. That was the thing that I wanted to do. And then you're like, wow, okay then. Okay, how do I do that again? How do I do that with a billion pounds? <laughs> you know, but it, it's, a, it's a positive experience and it, it shows you positive things. That's something that perhaps you can go back to in later life when you need it and draw on, you know, which certainly with my difficulties going, going ahead, um, having those lessons were useful. That's unbelievable that your, your debut was against the West Indies. <laughs> isn't it? That's talking about your stars aligned in your home country. You, you, you understand yeah. me? So it's like, wow, look at that. That's that's crazy. Was there money? Is there money in cricket? Did you get extra money for it? Uh, international? There wasn't, well, of course there's money, but it's not, it wasn't. Life-changing? Certainly not life-changing. Um, I don't like to mention sort of numbers, but... Yeah. Let's say I'm I'm away and I'm touring with England, my first tour away in England. I was away for three months in the Caribbean and payment for that was 13 grand. Yeah, ah, there you go. So it's, you have all this pomp and you have all this ceremony and people see you on TV and the, ex the interpretation they get of that or what they get from that is, wow, you're minted and blah, blah, blah. Now, 13 grand, we're going back now 30 years on top of your, your wages, then you're nice. Yeah. But it's not a place where you can afford to party. It's not footballers' wages. You understand. Yeah. It's a, you, you, you go into the wrong nightclub, 
you make a mess for that month. <laughs> 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 yeah. So it, 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 it's that sort of thing. Now, of course, over the years, we're here for, and we're now, people go for six weeks to the IPL and they're earning a million dollars and so forth. But it, it isn't that space. You're, you're playing as a professional. And my first professional salary was three grand as a professional cricketer. So even playing for England, I'm playing at, you're playing for clubs or you're what they call a senior player. You're still only in those times, 11 or 12 grand. So then you get selected for England and you're doubling that. Yeah. So you're going, okay, I'm doing all right. I can afford to do whatever I need to do and I can pop out and have a couple of shandies sometimes. But we're not talking about, um, at certainly at that time, about money that you're talking life changing that you can go and do those things. We're talking yeah. about a situation where compared to other people, you're still earning reasonably good money, but you can't go and make a mess. I mean, it, what you don't want is to bump into one of your football mates and have to have a night out with him mm -hmm. because by the end of it, you'll be broke. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? But life, life, life is good. You're a, you're a young person and you're, off on your journey and you're starting to earn some money. Money means that you can um, go and buy a mortgage and go and get a car and that sort of thing. So you're in your experience and you're thinking, yeah. you know, um, this is get, this is great. But it isn't the sort of football and... Glamorous is, is the other side of things no, football. Not, certainly not with, not with um, the finance mm -hmm. um, at that time. Um, now... Um, it's in a healthy place where there's a lot more money around and people can earn um, decent wages. Yeah, yeah that's, that's massive all around the world. Sc yeah, Scotland, I, I know a couple of boys that play oh, for them, but mate. they're shit, man. And uh, no. as, uh, listen, 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 we, listen. We've, we've just no, no, I'm gonna, listen, I'm going to stick up for the boys here because <laughs> listen, <laughs> the Scottish boys, yeah, made it, yeah, to the Super Twelves. Yeah, yeah, they made it there. Done okay. well. Yeah, yeah, done it hasn't well. it hasn't gone well since they've been there, but it's a good learning curve because mm -hmm. they'll know for next time they get there to make sure that all those big boys don't mug them. Yeah, as they're doing now. They need to at least <laughs> yeah. say it's a foot in the door. But listen, yeah. listen, it's just it's always the same story with Scotland, like football, cricket, whatever. But it's, it's just we always get there, but never go any further. It's Listen, I, 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 and it's fucking story. sad to me cut numbers. We've got great, listen, we've got great individual footballers. We've got great snooker players. And, and darts is a thing that like, we've got uh, decent people. Um, but when it comes to cricket, it's not, I don't think we've got the weather for it either up in Scotland. Okay, I must admit, I've been to Scotland three times to play cricket. And mm -hmm. every time it's completely rained off. I <laughs> <bowl of balls. laughs> so I can't disagree. Uh, However, listen, I think for <laughs> the resources Scotland have and how long things have been going, I think they did brilliantly well to get get to the World Cup. Um, I think it'll be a massive learning curve for them um, going from playing associate members to playing the big boys and people bowling at... 90, 95 miles an hour rather than 80, 85. It's a big shift. And it's those sort of shifts that if they're looking to get better, that they're going to have to do over the next few years. But I'm pretty confident looking at some of them and knowing the Scottish mentality mm -hmm. that they'll give that a good go. To kick on and push on. Yeah. See the training for cricket. Obviously you said full, full time you were training twice a day. Is that how, is that ex as extreme as it is? Like training nonstop? Well, certainly... It, it can, it can be. Um, that is a bit extreme in the sense that you're talking it's pre-season. So you've just come back from the winter and you've got a month to get fit. So there's a lot of running going on. There's a lot of training. There's a lot of practice going on during that time. Once the summer actually starts and you're actually playing cricket, some of these games are going on for four days. And then after that, there might be a game straight after that. And then I leave that, go to a test match, play for five days. And the day after that, you're back playing. So during the summer, it can be problematic or it used to be problematic trying to find the right rest. So it was hard to play and train, if you see what I mean, because you're already exhausted because you've just worked, you've done five days, you've got two days off. So the question is now, do you train in those two days or do you rest up for the game? 
<laughs> so it was that it was that sort of thing because there was a lot of cricket. There was more cricket than there was now from the four day game. There was I think there's now twelve. There was eighteen four day games and four three other competitions. So and you were playing for England. So England would bore you for five days, but the day that game's finished, the next morning, you're back paying for your club the next day because they want you back. So the training during during the summer at that time, you just I just had to kind of work it out. Sometimes I went to the gym first thing in the morning, sometimes it was just stretching, but it was more kind of feeling your body yeah. and getting up and go, you know what? I'm not gonna yeah. Is it tiring from the test matches? Go for five days. ODIs was it fifty overs? Yeah, T Twenty. Like, so even you're, if you're doing a, playing a test match and you have to stand there all day, what what's what's a good game for you to play? in? as test matches become boring, have you got to stay tuned on or do you tune out? How? Okay, how I mean, does, how I, does think, it... I think in in more in my time, it was more the long format. Mm -hmm. um, people were focused on whether it was test match in five days of test match is or the county games, which were which were four days. But that's the sort of cricket you, you grew up on. And to somebody looking from the outside, you can go, mate, how can you stand up there doing nothing for hours? Yeah. And then you go, I'm not really doing nothing, actually, mate. We've got a plan here. We actually work into something. So there's things that are keeping you occupied in between that because you've got a plan. So it's not just an actually st um, mm -hmm. a, um, a stand up. And you know what? Even now at 50, sometimes on a Saturday, I'm stood in the middle of a cricket field and just look around and go, is there any other place you prefer to be? And the answer is generally, no, this is nice. I like this. That's a great feeling though, that you're out there and you, and you do something that you love. Like, yeah, you're going, actually. People are just so impatient now. For people who does, doesn't understand cricket, you can understand that if somebody's standing there for hours and hours and there's not much happening to think yeah. what the fuck is going on here but cricket is massive globally it seems to have boomed the last 10 years even more so i think i think there's a lot more excitement perhaps the cricket that people are seeing now is one that appeals to perhaps so many more people um is that because of the shorter formats i think so i think so i think you look at the longer format and perhaps it's more niche you really got to have a real passion for the sport and Generally speaking, it's people who've grown up within the sport in some way, shape or form. Yes, of course, there's new people coming. But I think the new format, it has so much razzmatazz, so much excitement to it. It appeals to young people who generally may not like cricket. And they go, actually, that's quite exciting. I like that. And it doesn't take forever because, of course, they're impatient. Yeah, they're not going to want to hang around for five days. The world we live in, there's not many people who want to who hang around for five days to find out the result of a match. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So cricket, in that sense, is quite niche. You know, and most people, it's more instant. And the shorter form, I, um, it gives people that. It's a crash, bang, wallop, and there's excitement all the way. Um, I went down to the Oval to see a 2020 match as a spectator and I was in there and I was like, okay, I get it now. I I didn't really watch the cricket. It was the atmosphere and the enjoyment and everything else that was going on. So certainly I think the short format has helped and there's so many different formats in the sense that so many different tournaments to that short format. You've got the Indian Premier League, you've got the competitions here, you've got the 100 here, you've got the Blast, you've got competitions in Pakistan and the Caribbean. So there's just so much more of it going around the world for people to have a look and go, actually, that's not bad. Rather than perhaps when I was younger, that's boring, what are you doing? <laughs> everybody's, everybody's wearing the same colour, everybody's this, you know, it's like uniform. Uh, some people. Yeah. Um, and then you have this thing where there's just so much color and so much excitement. And the aim, I think any young person, even somebody who doesn't play cricket, the idea of hitting a ball and hitting it over the fence, hitting it that far, has got to give you some sort of thing. Yeah. If you see what I mean? Yeah. The reason I know about cricket is because I used to be a bad gambler. 
So I used to bet on the Indian Premier League. <laughs> I used to bet on the Indian Premier League, the Mumbai Indians and uh, Ted Dilker. And I, that's the only reason I know, because I used to watch it with the crowd and the atmosphere. I used to enjoy the T20 because it was fast, it was explosive. Yeah, yeah. Your bet used to go all over the place from favourites to underdogs because of, Because everything uh, is changing everything so quickly. Everything's changing so quickly. So I, my buzz used to be through the fucking roof. Oh, that's why I know about like, all that <laughs> shit. Like, I'm a football background, but I used to watch the T20s doing it. It was just fucking unbelievable watching that Premier League and the, the money they used to get. And it was all the biggest players from around the world. And like you see, all the bright colours and the crowd were all nuts. And uh, I just love betting on it. Thankfully, not anymore because I fucking lost fortunes. I never had a clue what I was betting on. But yeah, what's the, the best game you've ever played in? What's the one that stands out in your mind? Okay, we talked about that one that the my debut. Mm -hmm. um, so that's proud all, moment. Yeah, that's always in there. That's always in there. Um, but perhaps going to India um, and scoring a, a hundred in India in those conditions. Um, bearing in mind, last year we were there, and perhaps it was the same old problems where we were still struggling to to bat and the Indian turning wickets. You know. Um, so to have a have a moment where for a few hours you mastered that kind of I'll take that. Okay. You need no more information. You can clearly play because you you spent a couple of hours hitting the Indian bowlers. So, so yeah. <laughs> forget all the other games you played in <laughs> We remember that one. So that one sticks out, but to be able to represent England in a not just a World Cup tournament, but to get to the final. Unfortunately, um we lost to Pakistan nineteen ninety two. But of course, that game stands out. Um, to play in a World Cup final is, is special, even though for many years after it, I was, let's say, upset. I could use another word, say vexed, because we didn't win. But after a while, you go, wow, thank you that I had that opportunity. Okay, it wasn't the perfect scenario because we would have left with the trophy. But at least you you got an opportunity to play in a World Cup final in front of 80,000 people. And you go, yeah, okay then. I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. Was that was that a, a hard one to take, losing the World Cup final? Yeah, it was at the time. I think as a young person then, I, I looked at it and I thought, oh, a bit of a waste. What's the point in getting all the way here and losing? And I'm stood there on the field and I'm looking at the Pakistanis and they've got the trophy. They're so happy. And I wanted to be part of that team that potentially had that trophy. And everybody in England was so happy because we had that trophy. So there was a bit of envy going on there. And as a sportsman, certainly as a young guy, I didn't want to lose. Yeah. Should have caught that one. If only you didn't. Oh. Um, bugged you for a while or it bugged me for a while and then eventually you, you get new thoughts and you, you go you know what that was alright I should have perhaps in the moment perhaps it's hard in the moment appreciated that moment a little bit more yeah, yeah. who's the biggest who's the best English player you've ever played with I'd, I'd first of all I'd, I'd say that I've played with some some great English players um, Robin Smith, Angus Fraser, Mike Atherton, uh, Alex Stewart, um, and probably a whole host that I can't remember um, at this moment. But the person who sticks out um, was Graham Gooch. You know, um, he led by example, but when it got tough, um, he was up for it. Um, sometimes I'd look at him and go, I I get it while you're captain. Because when it's hard, Yaka, when we're there and we have to face Kersley Ambrose and all those West Indian guys, you're up for it, mate. Um, so he wasn't necessarily the only person that was up for it. You know, um, Mike Atherton was a, was a great fighter and, and gave you nothing. You know, sometimes as a sportsman, you want something from some sort of interaction. You want some energy from him. He gave you nothing. He was a fighter. Um, but probably uh, for me, um, Graham Gooch. Um, fantastic, fantastic yeah. player. So a phenomenal career, like you say, World Cup final, 
nearly 100 internationals. Like, it's, a, it's a for a kid who's came from where you've came from at exactly. 10 years old, making your England debut at 22. And then when your career started, did the career start sliding? And that's when changes started to happen? No, there's, of course, with things like that, there are injuries. Um, there's a hip injury. I'm out of the game for a year. The diagnosis is that I'm not going to play cricket again. I then decide, nah, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to get stronger. Um, I did. Um, a year later, I'm at a new club, um, having to prove that I'm fit enough to be a professional cricketer again. How old were you then? I am 26. What? They told you you were going to retire at 26? Yeah, yeah I'm 26 and I've left Nottingham. I'm at the Oval now. Um, a bit stronger because I've had to go to the gym, but the injury is still the injury and it's still there. So I'm managing it, but one of the ways of managing it is just simply by putting on a bit of bulk, um, basically. So at the end of the day, I'm still limping around and I'm still in pain and all those things, but I can work through it. Um, and essentially from there to the end of the career, um, I'm doing that. Um, if I play for one game or if I'm working hard today, tomorrow it, it ain't going to be that strong. That's how it was, how it was working. So from there, it's, it's, it's managing it. Um, but Are you taking painkillers? No, no. Um, did you tell people that you were injured or did you just try no, and play for it? everybody knows the injury because that's why I had to prove my fitness again mm -hmm. when I went to a new club because I knew I had a hip injury and it was just a question of whether I could actually perform. Um, unfortunately, um, I could perform because I was stronger. Um, but it still needed to be managed. I was still in pain. You're talking about, you know, that sort of pain that shoots down your leg, that sort of thing, not just, oh, my leg hurts. It's so at times you, your mind doesn't want to put any pressure on it. So you're running into bowl and your brain's going, I'm not having any of this, bruv. <laughs> you're on your own, mate. You're on your own here, mate. And you go, shut up, shut up. Just do what I tell you. <laughs> uh, let's do it, do it light-hearted way. But from there, that's the struggle um, with the body. There, there are struggles with other things because I suppose at that time, I'm that likely lad. So anything that seems to be going around, I'm involved in it. Um, people come to me for match fixing. I report it. I end up in hot water. Um, that sort of thing. Um, and on top of that, I make my own mistakes. You know, even with the hip, I get back into the England team. I'm having a great summer. I'm leading the way that summer. Probably the last game of the summer. In fact, I'll tell the story. The last game of the summer is it's Pakistan. We're playing at a test against Pakistan. I've had a good summer. India were here earlier in the summer, one man of the series against India. So all is good. And it's a Saturday. And I'm sat there and the manager comes. And we're going to have a picture taken, a team photo taken on the Sunday. So he's inquiring who's got out their blaze, blazers. But we've already been told we could wear our suits. So I didn't bring my blazer. But I'm only 15 minutes away from the ground. So I go to the manager. It's all right, man. So at the end of the day, I'll go home and I'll get the blazer. So I get home at the end of the day and I look around. It's like, actually, my house looks quite comfortable here. I'm going to stop here tonight instead of going to the hotel. But don't worry. I'm about the same distance from the ground as the hotel is from the ground. So it isn't a problem. But two o'clock in the morning, I've woken up. And I'm, I'm restless. So I've called a friend. But... I'm trying to think, I'm trying to be professional as I'm not being professional. And I'm thinking, well, actually my friend lives closer to the ground. So in the morning, it's just to hop down to go to the ground. So go see a friend, have a, convers have a few conversations, go to sleep. I'm meant to be at the ground half eight. I'm sleeping and some sun hits the side of my face. And I don't know how this happened. In that instant, my brain has worked out the time and that's not an eight o'clock sun. Do you know that feeling? Where, because of this, and I've opened my eyes and I'm looking at a clock that's already saying half past nine. 
and I'm meant to be at an international match at 8.30 in the morning. And I'm like, holy shit. I'm down there within 10 minutes, but it's already done. You've done what you've done and you've mucked up. And that was the day. That was my last test for England. Because you were late? Yeah. That was my last test match. Was that an excuse to um, do that to you? Or was it? Well, was it let, was... Me, let, let, me, let me just say, it, probably at that, at, at that time, there had been so much water under the bridge. It was perhaps naive of me to put my head on a silver platter for somebody. If you see what I, if yeah. you, if you understand. Yeah. Yeah, it was that sort of it. Um, yeah, so they waited for a moment. And yeah, I yeah. provided that. I provided was that for the, the match fiction when people came forward to fix a bet and you says no and you gave their names? No, no. Um, I, I I gave no names. I Listen, when it comes to match fixing, bizarrely enough, I know very little. What I know is because somebody came to me and started talking and I'm there going, flipping out. Right. Now, whether what he's saying is true, I don't even know. But he's gobbing about it, isn't he? So I'm there going, mm -mm -mm. but now I'm in a funny position now because I've met with you eh? and I'm exposed. So here what? I'm going to tell the people who this concern eh? and I've got to tell them all that you said. I don't know if any of that is true, what you said, but you said it to me. Yeah, and I've sim I've got to tell you, and I repeat that to you, and just go, mate. I'll see you later. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. um, but sometimes it's never that simple. Sometimes you get caught in that. And people go, well, blah blah blah. He's lying. He's this. He's that. He's doing it to make money. He's doing it for this. Doing it to that. But that was just me. Perhaps some of the times ending up in a place where somebody has come to me, and. If I kept that quiet and not done anything and then that come to light, I would have been on the other side of that, wouldn't I? Yeah. So, so you try to, yeah, yeah, you you try to cover your own ass, <laughs> uh, like, but it still backfired on you. It's to do with me. This bloke said that and I'm obliged to tell you, your stuff, I'm off. Did they think, though, that you were lying? No, they didn't. They knew I wasn't lying. Mm -hmm. They knew I wasn't lying. Um, they just didn't want to know. They just didn't want to hear it. They knew I wasn't lying. Listen, you know when you're telling the story and you're looking into people's eyes whether they think you're lying or not. Mm -hmm. They knew I wasn't lying. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I, I was sat there with them. And it wasn't just about telling the story because the police were informed. So, of course, the police had investigation and it corroborated things that I'd said. But also, listen, when the fallout was coming and I was getting it, one of the police officers that was doing the investigation called me and apologized and said, listen, I'm, I'm sorry how it's turned out for you, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it was more convenient at that time for other people to perceive me in a certain way, that to perceive that, oh, it's not a real thing. It's just this guy who's a bit of a liar. He's a bit dodgy. He's a bit this. He's a bit that. So perhaps it was an easy fix. Do you come with a scapegoat? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So international career's over. You've had a great career anyway. Um, what's life like after that? Um, it's different. I'm, I'm not insular, um, because you've just watched me and I had years left on my contract and I'd made plans. So all of those things are gone now. And of course the reputation, um, isn't, isn't any of the better. So I've kind of wandered off. Um, not so much interested in, in cricket at that level. I still play a bit of club cricket. I, do some count. I work for the council um, in Nottingham for a bit, um, coaching young kids um, cricket. The idea there is that we'll use cricket to try to get young kids off the streets. Um, did that for a while. Um, opened my own cricket academy um, in in Slough. Did that for a while, but it's funny. Um, cricket and playing cricket was easy, and I say easy in the sense that it's easy when it's the thing that makes your heart sing, <laughs> you know? And then there's just a period of time trying different things, looking for that thing that makes your heart sing, sing in the same way. You know, there's so many things you could do. Yeah, I could do that, I could do that. But my heart's not in that. I don't feel it. And you hope that something will come along that you'll have the same passion for. Um, 
I would say didn't. And for eight years, I did different things. And I'm now 40. And I'm playing for the association, the Cricket Association. And it's now a time where 2020 is getting popular. And people see me and go, flipping hell, you can still move, mate, can't you? I reckon you could do a job for us. And in no time at all, I'm coming out of retirement that I've been in for 10 years. And I'm coming to play a young man's sport now at 40. Um, play T20. Um, signed up at the Oval. Um, it's a quick thing in the sense that obviously they have um, reservations, but it's pushed through. And this is a pay as you play. So if you don't play, you're not going to get paid. So you're taking a chance here. You, you've already gone away to Australia for X amount of months and so forth off your own back. And this summer, unless you play, you're not going to get paid. So that's a lot of time. Um, so we started the season and then that thing happens. The second game I play, I've dived and I've fallen on my hip and it's over. <laughs> it's bloody over. Um, again, I've retreated out, but I'm a bit challenged now. Um, I haven't got any cash. Um, when I'm saying I haven't got any cash, I mean I haven't got any cash. The last cash went on the training and you were hoping to recoup some of that later in the year by playing cricket. And now that's not going to happen. Um, how are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to do this? You're not even going to be able to play cricket anymore. Um, what are you going to do now? I need space. I need a couple of months. I need some time to work this out. How am I going to do this? I need some cash. What are you going to do for money? And... Listen, I know so many different people. Yeah, different walks of life. And all of a sudden, their money talk became interesting to me because I didn't have any. And I started listening to conversations that I'd never listened to. And so I was thinking in my head, oh, wow, that's a lot of money. That could work out. And it seems within no time at all. Um... I'm on my way to the Caribbean and the idea is I'm going to bring some drugs back into the country and I'm going to get paid 50 grand for doing that. Um, I, get, I, get, I keep saying to people that, you know, at that moment, I'm not thinking that I want to be a drug dealer. I want to be a bad boy. I'm just thinking 50 grand, that would be handy. Handy just to give a bit of space and you work out what you're going to do next. You know, just alleviate the thing and... Sometimes, like a lot of things, the way out or the thing, the way out you choose just gets you deeper in, just causes more problems. So here I am coming back. And of course, I'm stopped at the bloody air. I'm stopped at the air. 14 kilos, like for cocaine? Yeah. For, well, not four. Thankfully, it wasn't 14 because there would have been even more time. Mm -hmm. It ended up being, I think it was 4.6 or something like that. They say it's 14, but doesn't they? Yeah. They say it's more, doesn't it? They're not? Yeah. Uh, I think it makes it more an interesting story. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think it makes it more impressive mm -hmm. if you go, you know, he was caught with a ton. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm thinking 14 kilos, 50 yeah. grand, I'm thinking you could have got more. <laughs> no, you understand. <laughs> you, yeah. you know, so you, you see, um, and of course... Um, what was the process when you're, you've got it in your case? Where did you go for it? Where did um, you pick it up? It's in, it's in St. Lucia. Uh -huh. So you went to St. Lucia. Were you shitting yourself going on the plane? It's listen, not so bad going on the plane. Listen, uh, listen, uh, listen, listen. You're shitting yourself, or you're shitting yourself all through the process. Yeah. Um, I suppose what desperation does is that you take that chance on a hope and a prayer, because it is a hope and a prayer, because you don't really know what's going on, because that's not, that's not your scene. So you're just hoping that somebody looks by you, don't they? and don't actually see you. Um, and I guess from what I know now, that I was the obvious guy um, because they were kind of waiting for me. Um, so, but listen. 
So it wasn't a case of going through customs and the pitch. They were waiting for you? Yeah, yeah. You feel as if somebody maybe stuck you in? Listen, I try not to get too much caught up in that. Um, I did what I did. I got caught. Whether somebody shot me in or whether I just behaved and everything was just so badly done that it was a, it was an obvious thing. Um, I try not to sort of go down that route. I just, you did that and you got caught however you got caught um, and you had to do your time. But the whole process on the plane and everything else, um, you've been in, I've been in places you've faced people bowling at 90 miles an hour, 95 miles an hour. Um, but this felt like kind of real fear. <laughs> you know, <laughs> shit, you're um, fucking paranoid. Everybody's watching you. Uh, even the baby is watching you. <laughs> it's that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, start of, I suppose, what I'd call, I'd call the dark times. And I'm sentenced to to 13 years um, in jail um, to start with, to be honest. I've never been there. I don't know about that. So it's all your fears and all the things that I've seen in different places and all the things I've heard people say. And then there's a whole idea of 13 years. You can't, I can't comprehend it. Um, at a push, the plan has been, okay, I'm playing cricket from April and it's going to finish in September. And I can cope with that. But to make a plan for 13 years or to be looking forward to something or the only thing to be looking forward for now in your life is 13 years away. It's like, you're not going to sleep in your bed for 13 years. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do that. And your, your brain or your mind at the time just makes it even worse. You're not going to do that. It's going to be 13 years before you this. It's going to be 13 years before you have your own autonomy. It's going to be 13 years of being told what to do. And in that moment, 13 years seems like a number of lifetimes. And you just go, wow, how am I going to even get through that? How am I going to even... Can I even get through that? You know, um, because 13 years is asking a lot of you and it's going, are you, are you man enough? Or when you go to jail as well, are you woman enough? You know, can you handle this? You, you think you, you think you're a strong person, but this is going to test you and really see who you are, you know? And it did. It did because there's a time, certainly in the first year, where I'm not sleeping. And I mean, I'm not sleeping. I'm dreaming two dreams every night, but I'm dreaming them and they almost seem like they're on a loop. One, I'm running and somebody's trying to catch me, but I'm running in slow motion. I can't run fast. I'm trying to run fast, but I'm moving, I'm moving slow, slow. And then the other dream, I'm perched on the end of one of those, uh, cranes they have all around London these days, right at the tip of it, and it's howling with wind. And, of course, I think I'm going to fall. But I tell you, I had these dreams so often. I'd have these dreams, and eventually I knew I wasn't going to fall, or whoever was chasing me wasn't going to chase me, because I'd had them so often, I never fell. <laughs> but they were scary. So I knew emotionally that... I was in a bad way and you're always afraid. And I knew all those things because my dreams were telling me that I wasn't sleeping. I'm thinking about everything from a negative point of view because everything I'm looking at is a mess. There's not one bit of hope about this. You may think of your brother and how much you like your, you love your brother, but then your brain go, yeah, well, look what you've done to him. <laughs> so you just, and I'm burning up, mate. I'm absolutely burning up till I get to a point where I go, unless I get some sleep, unless I get some rest, I'm not going to, I'm just not going to survive. And that's when it, it dawned on me. You, you, you hear of sometimes people under certain circumstances, they call them going crazy. Um, and in that moment, I realized you can call it going crazy. But in that moment, something like that happening to me would have been a relief just to get some rest. And you go, holy shit. 
That's why that could happen sometimes. That's actually, that's actually managing yourself. Because right about now, going mad, or what people call going mad, and not taking this as seriously as I'm taking it, would be a benefit to me. And that was that, that moment when I went, shit, this, this thing is getting really deep. You need to get a hold of your thoughts here. Because how your brain is working on its own, you're just not going to survive through this. It's just coming up with negative after negative. You So, a bit of self-talk, but a bit of reading. I've always been a bit of a reader as regards to what people might call spirituality book. And I had this book with me. It's a big, thick blue book. It was called The Course in Miracles. And it started talking, it was talking um, about that sort of thing, about things not necessarily being black or white, but actually you are the person that actually colors the situation. You are the person that actually decides whether something is good or bad and, and so forth. And started reading into that and started looking at myself and seeing how you're processing this stuff. You know, um, there's a bit of anger that the fact that I'm even there um, looking at that and actually accepting full responsibility um, for all of your life and the choices that you've made. Because the truth is, whatever those choices are, is those choices that's led to this moment. Yeah, and you can go, he did this, they did this, and there's always somebody who does something. There's always them who do something. But it then occurred to me that even in those situations, that the person who gets the final say is me. Nobody has marched me anywhere. So ultimately, whether I believe people or not or whatever, the person who's been in most control of this situation most of the time has been me by far. People have come and gone. So here I am in this crappy situation, but yet we're still looking to blame somebody else. And eventually my brain just went, nah, mate. I don't have any of that. That's a load of bollocks, mate. All right? if, there's anybody, that. if there's anybody here you don't need to look at, it's it's going to be you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've met crappy people. You've met this. All of that is true. I'm not saying it's not true. But the person who's had the most influence on this thing, mate, was you, bruv. So... Yeah. How were you treated in prison? Being from England International, probably all over the papers when it came uh, when you got sentenced, like, did people treat you differently? Did you get any special treatment in prison because of who you were as well? It's not it's not so much a place for special treatment as people think. Um, you're locked up, you're locked up, so to speak. Um, your door can't be left open any longer than anybody else's because you're an England cricketer, um, those sort of things. I think in most part, it depends, I think, on who you are as a person. Um, you can be in jail, and it's an easy place for people to use, lose a little bit of their humanity. That's perhaps the inmates and perhaps the, the officers as well. Um, but I found generally that if you treated the officers as, as people, um, that more often than not, that you got things or you saw a better side of them. Um, really, um, people were curious. The most curious thing is people want to know, how do you go from being an England cricketer? And clearly you must have been earning billions, not, but to be in, or having the need to be a drug smuggler, you know? And I think we touched on that perhaps at the beginning, um, that the monies that we're talking about aren't necessarily the monies that uh, people imagine that went um, with that role. Now, that's not an excuse because, as I pointed out, it was decent, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't that space where um, you're, earning, you're earning millions. So, so that was the curious thing because people couldn't understand if they've gone, well, you're an England cricketer. With an England cricketer, it meant that you've got a palace somewhere and you've got this and that. So it's a big jump. So that was the, that was the inquiry. People wanted to know what went on in the middle. Um, the general perception is that you partied hard and you did this and you spent. Um, I partied quite a bit. Um, I spent um, quite a bit um, also. But those aren't the issues. The issue is that perhaps if you don't know about business and you don't take care of business, 
eventually um, there's a crisis, you know. Um, and perhaps as a young man, I was more geared on my enjoyment and just enjoying the experience. Now, again, I wouldn't even sit in here now and say that's the criticism because I worked so many things out of my system. And it was a lot of fun too. <laughs> the, thing is, it's, yeah, it's not. the thing is, though, we think it lasts forever and we'll never get old. Listen, listen, as a young person, of course it's going to last forever. I mean, I remember being 20 odd and people talking about 40 and 40 could have been a million years away. How long I thought that was going to take. And you turn around a couple of times and you look in the mirror and then there's this 40 year old looking back at you, <laughs> you know. Um, but listen, mistakes have been made. And of course, if I was to have some moments again, I would make um, different choices. But I've enjoyed my experience. Um, and perhaps to even sit here and to be able to go, I've even enjoyed my mistakes. I didn't necessarily enjoy that big one, going to jail that much. But even my mistakes have been in, um, informative to me. So in that case, when I'm, when I'm quiet and I'm still, I look at it and go, wow, it's been a blessed life. 13 years is a bit much though, is it not? But you're not thinking, fuck me, they've, they've, they've threw the book at me there, like it's, a seven or an eight possibly, but a 13, it's, 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 does murderers get fucking 13 and 15 years? Oh, I met, I met them and they got less at times. <laughs> so, Do you know what I mean? So, but was there a time you're thinking that why why listen, they threw the book at listen, you? You know what? You know what? That one, I just didn't bother going down there because after a while, I worked out the sort of thoughts that don't help and the ones that do. Yeah, blaming everybody else, yeah, but end of the day, you still get fucking caught for shipping drugs. Do you know what I mean? Like, I understand yeah. it, but for me, looking from the outside, like, I interview all different kinds of characters. Yeah, people who used to ship. 500 key, 1,000 key of cocaine, and yeah. some of them are getting nine years, and you've got 13 for four key. Listen, like. my take on it is they wanted me, mm -hmm. and perhaps like a few times in my life, I've presented the perfect opportunity um, in, in that sense. I think once it was me with my track record, um, it was never going to be um, a slap on the wrist, um, so to speak. Um, there's always, there's an argument you can go, listen, you could have got 15 years. It was your tariff, I think it was between 10 and 15. So you got 13. So that's in the middle. Um, so to speak, I think I did an interview with somebody who asked a similar question and they go, do you think that was a bit excessive? And why would that, why do you think that was excessive? And I just went, you know what? It's not worth me answering either of those questions because all of them, has pain in it for me. So why even bother? Yeah. If you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What am I going to come up with? Oh, Chris, they liked you so much, mate. They gave yeah. you say. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know what? Mm -hmm. It's done, mate. How many different prisons were you in? One, two, three, four. Uh, Did anybody ever try and test you? You know, it was, it was funny. Um, because you're a big fucking unit anyway. Do you know what I mean? They did have a bit of balls themselves to test didn't, you. Do you know? Only I'd been in jail six, four and a half years. The last week, somebody somebody uh, pulled the thing on me. Um, never been in, didn't get into any altercation. The boys did their thing. You know how it goes. They did their thing. People who were involved in that, um, never. And then the last week, I'm just cooling out. It's all done now. I'm there. Okay, big man. Thankful you survived this. It's all done. You're going. And the last week, I'm... I'm there and there's this moment somebody's got a thing and he's like there and I'm like eyes are wide open and I'm looking straight into his eyes and I'm clear and I'm going okay I can't fight this guy he's got something in his hands and if this goes on for any length of time I'm going to get damaged a number of times so if anything has happened here this has to be quick so I'm ready and I'm looking in your eyes and I'm waiting for you to blink because as soon as you blink, I'm going to have to move because unless I do, I'm going to get hurt here. Um, and he eased off and he eased off and he pulled back. Well, that was the only time, one time, the last week. Strange. 
it's just all that done. from God, mate. And I have to say, <laughs> if you have to, was it what was it like getting out then? What was it like becoming a free man? That was a, a lot of stresses. Did you feel like okay, I've learned my lesson, or were you thinking you'd maybe failed in life? What listen, was, what were you thinking? Listen, I'll be honest about the learning the lesson thing. Listen, come on, man. It was it was wrong in the first place. Um, I did it. Um, so we know we know. You look at your family, and you look at you look at my mum and the shit that you put them through, and how they feel and the stress that they've got. And you just go, nah, mate, that ain't the plan because whatever plan we have, we're not trying to make it worse for the people we love. You, you know, whatever plan you have, whoever you are, you're not going, you know what? I'm going to come up with a plan that's going to make it worse for my mom and make it worse for everybody I know. <laughs> you know, yeah, you yeah, don't yeah, do yeah. that. So here you are, you've done that. So you just go, okay, then that's, that's the hardest thing, though, that you'd give yeah. them so many wonderful yeah, years being in, in, in England International. Did they have any extent that things were that bad for you that were go you were going to take risks like that, or did they have a listen? They didn't. They they don't. They don't know mm -hmm. um, those things. I think also perhaps partially they live in that world where you see that cricket, you see that cricketer, and you look and you think everything is fine. You think, oh, he's on TV. He must be rich, and he must be this, and he must be that, and. It must be all of those things. And I don't think it's not necessarily just the general public who sometimes has that view. I think it can also be um, people people close to you. But having said all those things, I didn't reach out. Um, I'll be honest, um, I felt a little embarrassed because I thought I should have done better personally because I was the one who had that opportunity to do that, if you see what I mean, to fix things up. And... Certainly at that time, clearly I didn't have the nous to do it because I didn't. Um, pride was dented a bit. Um, yeah, yeah, of course pride was dented a bit. You you see yourself as, as, as you can look at yourself as this person, you think you, you're capable, and then situation is presented to you which shows you unequivocally that actually you dropped the ball and you weren't even aware there was a ball to be carried um, at that time. So, personally, you have to take that. Again, you can thrash around and try to blame everybody else. But I think the easiest thing, the thing that gives more release and the thing that allows you to move on and do better is actually just taking it on the chin and going, yeah, I'm mucked up. Uh, I should have known that. Um, actually, maybe lots of people came to tell me that, but I didn't listen. So... I would say there's a time, probably about three or four years in, where I'm going through my process, my internal process, and then eventually you just go, okay, I get it, it was me. You know what? Let's do this again. Let's, let's do this whole life thing again. I'm still breathing, yeah? I've learned what I, not what you need to learn, but I think I've learned enough um, about myself, about my own actions, that I'm confident that going forward for me. Yeah, I'm going to ace it. So yeah. let's do this again. If you mean, brother, like, I say this shit all the time, but we always make mistakes. We always fuck up in our minds. You don't know what kind of pressure and stress these people are under to make fucking shitty decisions, but we do. We don't know what's around the corner. We don't know what obstacles are going to arise. So see, when you went through the process of going through prison, were you disowned by old teammates and everyone? Or did anybody reach out and stand by you? Listen, it's, it's both, isn't it? Because you know, um, when you make certain choices that, certainly if you're talking about drugs, people can have such varied response to it. Um, I don't want to know, I don't want to be associated with that. And whatever stance people take, you can understand it. We got to protect ourselves. We can't be seen to be associated with this. So people did that. And then there are other people um, who reached out. But even in that moment, it ended up being a blessing because the people who didn't, after you've left jail, you don't want them around anyway. Yeah, you find out who the true ones <laughs> you are. It's always your family so, and the odd couple of friends. So uh, you look at it and you go, or oh, I went, or oh, I'm of a mind now where I'm looking at this thing now, we're a few more years into it and I'm looking at it and going, even with this, I'm winning. And my mind is now looking that positively at my myself again. I'm going, even with this, I'm winning. The people who aren't here 
I'm not the people that I was planning to move forward with anyway, or yeah. I'm looking to move forward with. So I'm pleased that that's happened. And then there are surprises and people come and wow, I mean, you didn't know they had such feelings for you or they cared, you know. Um, a friend um, came and he turned up at, at not at the jail, at the uh, courthouse and offered up three of his properties to help me to get bail. And you just go, wow, I didn't know, but, you know. So it's both sides, but I don't think that's unique. I think that's what happened in life when you make certain decisions. Some people go, okay, mate, I support you in that. And some people go, based on how I feel, I can't support you in that. I think that's wrong and I can't be a part of that. And in this case, it was it was no different. But I sit here and, I said, like I said, even that experience um, in the end bene benefits you or benefited me yeah. because you have to look at yourself. But in, the, in those moments, you see everybody else as well. Yeah, I like that method of thinking on it. Understand you did make a mistake. Understand that people can accept that and, and will turn their back, but also taking the positives at the true ones and un the people who go, do you know what, you fucked up, but I've still got your back. And you'll find out, okay, they're the ones I want in my life and not the ones that turn my back. But the thing about you, you understand why they did as well. For me, you shouldn't, but, because we all fuck up, but you find out who the true ones are in the darkest listen, times, I guess. Listen, what I would say is that we're here to make our choices. And... I shouldn't be making your choices for you. That's part of the experience. And a lot of your choices that you make, I'm not going to like. But that's part of the experience, bro. I'm not supposed to, I'm not necessarily have to like it. They're your choices to make, as they are mine. You know, and I suppose having a space where I could examine myself and get into that point and going, yeah, actually, I believe that. That's actually what I believe. How was it to adapt again to come into a bit of freedom, obviously you came over when you were 10, now you're coming out after a few years being inside, like, was that a different kind of experience? Yeah, it's, it's strange to start with because, I mean, for instance, I remember first going to my first home visit and my worry was whether I'd be able to use the train. Why? Think, well, I'd been inside, things had changed and I'd never been separated from my world. I'd always been perhaps part of that change where you've seen it. And here I was separated and things have changed and change how. So don't get me wrong. I, I think the worry was unreasonable because everything was seamless. I was also worried um, when I had to cross the road, whether I would look because I hadn't crossed the road in six years. <laughs> and I wondered when I got out the habit uh. of crossing the road, am I going to still look and, you walk out and I got to the road and I instinctively looked and I went, okay, that's, that's handy. Hard work trying to learn, <laughs> learn that again. Yeah. I didn't walk into the middle of the road. So I went, okay, that's handy. Um, the world had changed, the electronics in the world had changed. Um, I think that stuck out was when I came out, obviously you're trying to put your stuff, some of your stuff together. So, um, you call pension people and you call these people because you've been out of the loop and you want to know where everything, where things stand. And the big surprise was that before I could, I remember calling my pension company and go, oh, this is Chris Lewis, can you send me blah, blah, blah. And now all of a sudden I need 24 million different IDs and I've just come out of jail. Uh, my passport has been confiscated. I haven't got a driver's license. So... It's hard work to sort all of those things out until you get to sing that. So you start with the driver's license, but I need ID for my driver's license. But I wanted four ID. <laughs> and this is going around in a circle for about 18 months um, to sort of get your, your stuff back together. So yeah, the world, the world had changed and you slowly, you realize, or you have to realize quickly that now it's a world of, IDs and checks after checks after checks and so forth where you could perhaps just phone up. I, I used to just phone up and go, hi, it's Chris. Can you send me this? And can you send me that? And, and that had changed. So you had to make sure that going forward, because there was so much you needed to do, there's so much you were, 
you you didn't have access to, now you had access again. But in order to access all of those services and those things, you need ID. You know, and it's like, wow. And it took a while to work out a way to get ID for ID without ID. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, use, using different things. Sometimes I even enclose the picture and go, it's me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's me. <laughs> I, just want my, yeah. I just want my driver's yeah. license back so I can, uh, but you eventually get that. So yeah, there's a, there's a bit of an adjusting. Um, and bearing in mind that was for me only four and a half years. So think about those who perhaps who, who who are longer. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of fear that you ain't going to manage, but fortunately people still have one head, you know what I mean? So, yeah, they, you yeah, know what I mean? Never so changed that much. You understand. Yeah, yeah. So what about when you wrote your book? How was that for you? That was, it was interesting in a number of, in a number of ways. Um, one, I felt that I needed to explain myself. Yeah, um, I got caught at the airport. I got sentenced. I went to jail, and I did my sentence. Um, nobody heard from me, and so I felt I I had to explain myself. And clearly, I was in a place where I just got clearly had mucked up. So just going, that was wrong of me. That was poor of me. Um, offering up some sort of an understanding or an excuse um, of how you got there and why you did that. Um, so that was really my purpose um, behind um, writing it. Um, I then did a play also, and the play was kind of taking it one step further or trying to take it one step further and talking about that emotional experience. So the play is a two-man play and it's essentially me talking to myself and it's set in the cell and it's that conversation that essentially we've just gone through, how that came about where you're going, I fucked everything up, I've done, I've excuse my language, sorry. I've mucked everything up, I've done this, I've done that. And then finally that part of you that's going, yeah, 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 but rude boy, you can still do. <laughs> yeah. You're not going, no, I didn't. You're going, yeah, you did. Yeah, that's that's that. But you can still do. You can still do that. Remember when you did this? Remember you were the person that came from the West Indies and became an England cricketer. So clearly there's something, you've got some sort of skills going on in here. And you start that. And the play kind of tells that story, tells that journey to the point where I feel that I kind of get myself back where you're that confident person again and you're looking out in the world and you're going, yeah, I've done that, but I can still ace this test, <laughs> you know? Yeah, 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 but I can still ace this. Yeah. yeah. Is that, see when you come out, see when you look back in your life and obviously you've had your highs and lows, like everybody, like what you've achieved is, is fucking unbelievable for kids obviously watching if it, where you've came from to be an England international and then obviously you've made your mistakes, the lows, but now you're picking things back up again, like you say, with the play, the book. Where do you go now, moving forward? I must admit that that journey that started inside, that internal journey, um, that's the one. And I don't mean that you're not going to see me here or you're not going to see me there or you're not going to see me in some nightclub or somewhere, somewhere. You probably will. <laughs> I hope so anyway. Life is to be lived, but... Overall, that for me, that's where that um, how you become happy in this in this life is you change your perception. There's too many other perceptions to change if you're looking outside. There's seven other seven billion other people on the planet, and I was confused for a bit. My plan was to get them all to behave. <laughs> and now you know, that's a really silly plan. So now I'm just going to work on me, mate. Yeah. It's so much easier. <laughs> and there's just, there isn't the level of stretch. I mean, you think if you're trying to control everybody else or what they're doing, how much hands on you, you're just everywhere. It, it literally sends you, sends you crazy. So that whole experience in jail, um, that's the ace in the pack that it's, that it's taught me that it's not so much about trying to change somebody else and it's about, changing yourself and your perception and now you see things 
that that bloke there who did that thing isn't necessarily an idiot. He's on his own journey and he's making his own mistakes just as you made your mistakes. And he's learning from his mistakes and so forth. And why I would look at it that way? Because it brings more ease to me because I don't get upset and I don't get angry. And you're not angry at people. It, it just it just works. Yeah. And also, people appreciate you not screaming and shouting at them and calling them an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> so it just makes it just makes uh, it just makes uh, it makes a better living. Mm -hmm. So for that's anybody it. that's watching, brother, that's maybe um, struggling, maybe having those that self doubt. You had your self doubt. You were in prison and you you push through it to then become back on a straight and narrow, staying fit and healthy. For anybody that's maybe having those doubts about life, what advice would you have for them? Listen. What I would say is that the world we live in, you almost become worthy to doing things. Because you've done this, because you've done that, because you're a nice person, you become worthy. And if you don't follow those things, then somehow you're not worthy. And what I've discovered is that you're born worthy and that worthiness never leaves you. You're a human being, big man. We're all human beings. and. You're inherently capable. That's really good. I was saying somebody to somebody in the gym that we are born geniuses. Most of the stuff that we learn, we learn it in the first five years of our life. We're like sponges. We're little geniuses. And for me, I had to go back to a place where I didn't get my strength from necessarily my cricket or anything like that. Because, of course, I'm a convicted criminal. So I must be a bad person if you see what I mean. Um, but in truth, I went back to a place where we were just human beings and we were all equal and we were all capable and built from there. And I would tell anybody, I don't care what you've done, what you're going through. Your worthiness isn't in question here. You were born worthy. You're inherently worthy. We live in a world that may suggest that you're not because you make a mistake. But as you point out, we all make mistakes. Um, the important thing is that we get up and dust ourselves off. It doesn't matter how big the mistake. I think in the play, how this was put over, we, we would have a discussion after each doing of the play. And this woman, this lady came at the end of one of this discussion and she goes, oh, Chris, I get it, I get it. She's going, what you're saying is, if you dig a big hole for yourself, it would be wise to know that the same spade you use to dig that hole is probably in there with you to dig yourself out. And I went, that's pretty much the story I'm thinking. We all fall, we all make mistakes. We all may find ourselves into varying hole. Yeah, but I guarantee you, the same spade you use to dig it, dig your, yeah, um, to dig that hole is available to you when you're in that hole to dig yourself out again. And that'll be you. I swear to God, don't care who you are. Yeah, you got that power inside of you. Because I never thought I had it. Um, it was a situation that brought it out. And when it came out, I knew it wasn't just special to me. It's in everybody. And you got that, people. Believe in yourself. You know, it's it starts from there. You have to, wherever you are believe in yourself that you can make a change that it can get better powerful brother for coming on today and telling your story listen I thoroughly enjoyed that and I genuinely wish you all the best for the future brother big man it's been a pleasure thank but, you so much likewise God bless bro <laughs>